I knew I was dead. Midnight, there's a knock at the door. There was two guys, and the one as I looked out to the right just nodded. And I could just feel my head being battered, like me, just constantly. I didn't know I'd been stabbed all over my body. My wife, she then come down the stairs with my one-year-old, walking through puddles of my blood. I mean, a scream was just, just pissed. What was the total amount of stab wounds? 20, did you say? Probably around, I think they said it was about 22. What was the investigation like on trying to find those four fellas? I just don't think they took it serious. Now they treated me and my wife was horrendous and vile at the time, you know. And this is where I ended up getting to the stage where I was on the verge of taking my own life. They weren't concentrating on 20 odd stab wounds, yeah. the mental health side of things, the overall impact on my family. If someone said to me, go through the depression again, or go through the stabbing again, what one would you do? I would go through the stabbing again. And to this day, do you know who done it? Darren, welcome to the show, mate. Welcome, thank you. It's uh, really good to have you. I'm really glad you made the effort because you have got some story, mate. Um, so I want to start, I want to roll all the way back. Where did you grow up? And tell me about that day when you got attacked in your house in mistaken identity. So yeah, I grew up in a place called Har Harlow in Essex. Um, council estate, normal upbringing. My dad was a lorry driver. Mum was a school dinner lady. So just a sort of normal upbringing, you know, kids running around doing knockdown ginger just a basic up normal upbringing you know yeah. as it was yeah. uh, eventually got married um had our first child bought a house uh in another council estate which was going fine my son was one years old at the time and then on a monday night uh, we got a knock on the door at midnight um and i used to do two jobs so i used to do my day job and then i used to do another job in the evenings just because we were skint you know and yeah. you, you just wanted to earn extra money to yeah. pay your bills so getting a knock on the door we didn't have mobile phones in. And how old were you when you got that knock on the door? Uh, 29. 29. 29, okay. yeah. So 55 now. Yeah. So getting on a bit. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, so 29 years old, I got a knock on the door. Um, I just thought, oh no, I've overslept because it was midnight because we used to start work somewhere between 12 and 2 at night or in the morning. Doing, um, what were you doing at the time? So I was just delivering newspapers to shops in a van. Okay. So I had my normal day job, yeah. uh, which was van driving, lorry driving. And then at night, just to earn an extra few quid, we'd go between midnight to say four or five in the morning, go and do an extra few hours every other week, just to put an extra couple of hundred quid in yeah, the bank. You know, play. so yeah. So Proper grafter. I always have been. Yeah, it's runs yeah. in the family, you know. So <laughs> mum and dad are both workers, you know, yeah. we family are workers. So yeah, yeah it's, I, I, it's an important trait. Yeah, of course. I think if you're an hard worker, and especially yeah. if you're going to go down the entrepreneurial route, yeah. you need to be a grafter. Yeah. You know, it's, it's vital, you know, and it gives you character. I, I think it helps build your character. So. so on that so on that day, was it a normal day for you at work? You come home and you answer the door at midnight. What were you thinking? Yeah, so it was a random one, actually, because I, I'd actually crashed my van during the day, yeah. but it was my last day with one particular company, and I was starting a new job the following morning, on the Tuesday morning. So when I say crashed it, I just bumped into someone at a, a roundabout in Redbridge in uh, East London there. No great shakes, no dramas. The guy we got out, didn't, he didn't want to take any details because I don't think it was his car. So he shut off and I just went about my business. Come home, dropped the van off with the company I've been working at. And then I had to go out to Bishop Stalford in Hertfordshire to collect the new van ready for my morning start. So done all of that, got in, uh, went to bed probably around the eight o'clock mark, something like that, because I was starting work at midnight or one o'clock in the morning. Um, and that was it. So midnight, there's a knock at the door. Um, I was quite lucky in a way because my wife was up with my one-year-old son. He was teething. Uh, we was lucky. We had a four bedroom house and she was in the other room trying to keep him quiet, obviously because of me working the hours I worked. Um, so I sort of heard this knock, I sort of run down in my pants to open and just, I got a spy on the door, but I didn't use it. You know, just, I thought it was one of my mates just knocking to say, you've overslept. So just open the door. And then that was, that was when the world changed forever. Like, you know, so um, there was two guys, as I looked out, there was two guys and the one, as I looked out to the right, looked beyond the other one and they just nodded. He just they just nodded and then I, I sort of remember just standing there with my hands up and at some point I don't know if I was knocked out or I've just got a mental blank whatever it is but I was then on the floor in sort of like a fetal position just trying to cover my head and I could just feel my head being battered like me just constantly I didn't know I'd been stabbed all over my body because ultimately the stab wounds I had I had seven serious wounds in my skull that I had one in really bad one in my back where you could put your whole hand in my legs across my bum across my chest Across my chest there, what they do is they put two blades in a standing knife and separate them with a match. 
So when it cuts you, it can't be sewn up. So lucky enough, they'd scratched me as opposed to, and broke the blade off in me here. So it wasn't a, a really bad wound. But in effect, you know, it's 20 odd stab wounds. We, can't, we don't know the exact number because in my skull, for example, the seven wounds, you know, I was stabbed in the same spot more than once. So, so, they, like were, so they were stabbing you in your head? Yeah, in my skull, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I look back on it now. I mean, I've done a, a few interviews. I do the talking. It's easier to talk about now. Yeah. In a little while when we get on to, when I start talking about my mum and dad and yeah. Wendy, the impact my world then had on oh, these people, yeah. that's the bit that breaks your heart, you know. When they come in, if you did you have a total blackout? No. So I, I can remember putting my hands out. Yeah. You know, self-defense, the door's coming this way and I can remember doing this and then I can remember being on the floor. Yeah. Now, and I just remember my head being battered. That's all I can remember. Were they you screaming know? and shouting? Were no, they... no words at all. Not that I heard anyone talk or say anything. It's a really strange thing as well. When they when they stopped, they just stopped and walked away. And I can, I can remember the, there's a green jacket, blue jeans on both of them, like a sort of uh, the old jacket. Harry and jacket yeah, we used yeah, to yeah. wear years okay. ago. Um, but in my mind, even now, 26 years on, you know, the description I've got in my memory is their shoes and their faces are blurred out like it's been done on a camera, yeah. you know, on the telly. Just, yeah. It won't let me remember the shoes and the face. Now, I'm quite sure I've seen it, but I've got no recollection of that whatsoever. How long, how long roughly did this last for, this beating? Well, we don't know. Um, it was around midnight. Um, it could have been two minutes to bang on midnight. Um, the first 999 call went in at three minutes past midnight and the second 999 call went in at six minutes past midnight. But that could have been, we don't know which one of those was me. So there was an eyewitness, a guy was out walking his dog. He heard the screams and the shouts. Yeah. He then walked his dog back to his flat and then went to a call box. Yeah. Obviously these days it'd be yeah. slightly different, you know, in the sense of yeah. you just, you know, pick up your mobile phone, but mm -hmm. then he had to go to a call box. So either his was three minutes past and it was going on at that point, And then I'd done the six minutes or vice versa. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And the year? So, uh, 19, I've got to get this right. So it's 1996. 1996. Yeah, so, and, and yeah, got it right. What, what, what was the movement after that straight to hospital? Yep. Yeah, so what was the wife, the kid, what, what was going through your mind at the time? Well, you well, didn't have a clue what was going on. Just get me to hospital as soon as possible. No, it was, it, the whole thing was random. So I was, there's a, there's a few things that happened at that moment. So eventually it stopped. And I, I still, to this day, couldn't tell you if I used my hands or my feet to shut the front door. Um, and when you see the state of the front door and the wall that it opened out onto, I'm surprised the front door actually shut. Yeah. Um, I then went and I crawled through my living room. So in a hallway, which is about four foot long, six foot long. Mm. And then I crawled through my living room. I got blood. I mean, you can imagine it's just pouring everywhere. Mm. You know, it's saturating the floor. It's all over the settees as I've tried to get through the living room. And the telephone was on the side at the back of the living room. So I picked that up, done me 999. Um, and I just sat there and... Literally, my wife was still upstairs. I mean, she was, you know, imagine being scared. She At first, she thought it was a, a bit of a nutcase had knocked on the door yeah. and was screaming. She didn't realise it was me screaming, yeah. you know, please stop, whatever I was yeah. shouting. Yeah. And then it was it was just all of a sudden then she heard me on the phone to the police and realised, hang on, that's, that's Darren. It's been, a you know, it's been oh, screaming. Hell. So she then come down the stairs with my one-year-old. So as she walked in, and this is a bit, you got... You got to put yourself in her position because I think, as much as I received the stabbing, mm. and it, you know it's not a nice. And as we go mm. through this, mm. you'll understand why it's not nice mm. in a lot of other areas. But as she's walking towards me with a one-year-old in her arms, now bearing in mind this happened in October and he was one in the September, yeah. so literally just turned yeah. one. She's now in a bare feet, walking through claret, claret everywhere, walking through puddles of my blood, Bloody right, hell. but not noticing. Yeah, I mean, a scream was just, mm. you know, it, it just pierced. You know, mm. at first I couldn't hear a lot. You know, that was that was a strange thing as well. And anyway, at some point, I just thought, I need to phone my dad. Right? I don't know what come over me. I picked the phone up and the 999 operator was still there. And I said to the 999 operator that I need to phone my dad. So she said, put the phone down, count to 10 and dial the number you want, which I did. I don't know how I did it. Yeah. I don't know. I couldn't even tell you why I did it. So I phoned my dad and I said, uh, can you come round? You know, I said I've been beat up because I didn't know I'd been stabbed at this point. Yeah, okay. You know, and as I'm looking about 10, 12 foot away from me at the bottom of my stairs 
was what I thought was a cricket bat, a small yeah. cricket bat, yeah. you know, like a children's size yeah. cricket bat. And that turned out to be an 18 inch meat cleaver in a cardboard and cling film holster that they hadn't used on me. Jesus. So, so they, they left that behind. They dropped it. Yeah. They'd obviously dropped it. So, so I was looking at it thinking I've been battered with a, yeah. a like a cricket bat. I didn't know. I still didn't know at this point I'd been stabbed. You know, not until the ambulance men carry, were carrying me out on this metal chair thing. Because they say they say when you get stabbed, you don't feel it until later yeah. on. You're like, oh no, what's going on here? And yeah. You, yeah, didn't I didn't add from a pain point of view, yeah. none. Okay, for the adrenaline, uh, adrenaline. Yeah. yeah, you know, we, what happens is if you stub your toe on a table, you'll get adrenaline rush, yeah. right? And the adrenaline then sub, sort of subdues the pain a bit. Yeah, and adrenaline can run from a split second through to three weeks. You know, and that's what happened with me. Luckily for me, the adrenaline kicked in and I didn't have any pain at all. The only time I had pain was when things started to tighten up, yeah. you know, with the stitches and things like that. Um, like stitches, I think they stopped counting about 40. I don't know how many I had. Yeah. Um, what, like, was the t what was the total amount of stab wounds? 20, did you say? We don't, the exact amount um, was probably around, I think they said it was about 22. So yeah, 22 actual wounds. But although there was 22 wounds, if you take the seven in my skull, that they could see that I'd been repeatedly stabbed in the same spot more than once. It could have been like 40, 45 right. actual stabs to the, to the and, head. And, and to this day, do you know who done it? No, no, not at all. This is the question I got asked and it was, it used to anger me. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but with the police, I went, I was on Kilroy. I don't know if you remember Kilroy, the show many years ago. Yeah. What's that? Daytime uh, telly Daytime stuff. telly yeah, stuff. Okay, I went yeah. on a show there and, uh, you know, just to be interviewed and they turned it into a bit of an anti-police program and yeah. I've got a lot of friends who are police and uh, I mean, my mates all come around and go, what are you saying? Like, you know, they, they turned it on me a little bit because mm. what happened was I said that when the police first started investigating because of where I lived, they judged me Yeah, and I still believe they did at the time. Why? Why? Because it was a crappy old estate in, yeah. in Essex that yeah. was, was known for a lot of Lots of wrong people about. Yeah. yeah, okay. And I think they judged me on that. Were no. you involved? Were you involved in any naughtiness before that attack? No, no, not at all. We had. Um, were you just a clean living fella earning a pound? Yeah, no, I mean, listen. We used to, as an eighteen-year-old, used to duck oh, and dive a bit, course. get some stuff on yeah, the market, yeah, and sell yeah, it yeah, on. Yeah. But uh, nothing, no, nothing at all. You know, I, I knew a lot of yeah wrong people yeah. locally. Yeah, you know, but not. It's just it's so far removed from my world, and there was some sort of notorious people who lived in, in the area. Yeah, and after the event, they suddenly thought that's a little bit out of our league. Yeah. And suddenly it was like everyone was saying hello to me in the street, all these yeah. naughty people thinking yeah. I was someone special yeah, when I weren't. Okay. You know, so I was just you running your meal every day, guy, van driver, living me life. And yeah, it was just it's either wrong house, wrong person. We don't know or it could be both, obviously, from my point of view, it's both. But a, this is like yeah. a proper living nightmare, right? Yeah, I mean, there was worse to come. Yeah. There was so, worse to come. So what was the what happened after the stabbing in hospital? Your mind, how, how was how was the mind after that? There's there's some funny bits. Yeah. Right. Um, listen, I, I do like a laugh, right? Yeah. And I, I've always laughed about the situation. My mum and dad don't like yeah. that side of things. They it still pains my mum. She she couldn't sit in this room now and listening to me tell the story. It breaks her heart, you know, because at, at 29 I was still their little boy. Yeah. You know, at 55 I'm still their little boy. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's those sort of stories. But we had to take all my carpets up and the. Bearing in mind, you've got a decent quality carpet. Then you've got underlay and all this had been stained with blood and the concrete floor had actually been stained with blood underneath. Okay. So me and my friend Stuart, we decided to, we thought it'd be funny if we drew one of those comedy sort of outline sketches. Of, so <laughs> when we put the new carpet down, the next person that moved in would see that. So my mum and dad didn't approve, yeah, as you yeah, can imagine. Yeah, yeah. So... Um, yeah, but that's the sort of thing we would have done back then. You know, he was going to turn up to my house with one of those knives, you know, that stick out, you, you know. <laughs> so, but you're masking over a lot of yeah. serious stuff, you yeah. know, and that, that was the thing. But so going to the hospital, first of all, the point point of coming out of the, the house. Yeah. So they've put me on this metal chair, uh, covered me up with blanket. I was freezing, by the way. That mm. I can't tell you that, that level of cold, yeah. you know, I can't begin to even explain it, how cold it was. I've never felt that cold before, never since. It was, you was just freezing. I felt like the blood, where I was sitting in my underpants, I felt like I was sitting probably six inches of blood. Yeah. I wasn't, it was just where I was wet with yeah. blood. But I was so cold, you know, really, really cold. And then when they carried me out and I realised it wasn't a cricket bat, it was a blade. Yeah. That was the point that I went, I've been fucking stabbed, like I've been fucking stabbed. You know, I suddenly then, the Anger. impact of it, 
hit me. Yeah. But then I went outside and there was a spell between getting from my house to the back of the ambulance. And when I looked up to the sky, it was it was the clearest. It was the the moment. There's there's a couple of points. Is I look to the the stars, see the stars, and I'm looking up at the sky, and that was me. I was as far as I'm concerned, that was my moment. I was gone. Yeah. You know that. That's the bit. We're now where I'm grateful. Yeah. You know, that's the bit I I knew I was dead. You know, I looked at that sky and that, I was gone. So you that know. was the moment you're thinking, I'm actually going to die right now. Absolutely. Jeez. Yeah. I, as far as I was concerned, getting in the back of the ambulance, I weren't going to come out of it. You know, you know, that's the sort of stuff that went through my mind. And that's why, you know, when I looked at the sky in October, November, and you've got that beautiful blue, yeah. midnight blue type sky with the stars. Mm. I can have a little smile now yeah. because it was the moment I didn't die, yeah. you know, but at the time, and if we'd have been talking about this two or three years ago, it, that was a really emotional part for me because it was, it was the turning point. There's lots of turning points to come, yeah. right, you know, but yeah. that moment in time. So then we got in the ambulance. I'd never been in an ambulance before. Mm. And apparently I was saying to the police, cause the police come with me as well in the ambulance and my wife, and I'm saying to him, can we put the lights on? Can we put the sirens on? Bearing in mind, this is a Monday night. Yeah. So um, anyway, apparently the ambulance driver shouted back, we've gone for a red light. Tell him, see if that can keep yeah. him quiet, you know? <laughs> so um, got to the hospital. I was under armed guard for a while. Um, I was on a particular bed um, where you could be seen. And apparently I'd spotted someone prowling around the hospital. Um, so suddenly I was surrounded by doctors and police and they dragged me off this bed and put me in another bed because... They knew straight away it was yeah. a professional hit. Yeah. Um, I didn't have a clue what was going on at yeah. this point. You know, just being shifted around, uh, dragged from one place to another. Um, so they then put me in a room with, I think, five old girls uh, where I was just in the corner out of the way. Yeah. Um, I don't I'm guard for a little while, um, but I was a bit... So these are two professional hitmen. Four in on. total. Four hitmen. Yeah. So two come in. Yeah. One waited at about 10 yards away as a lookout, and the other one waited with a getaway car. So... And they, obviously there was no CCTV back then, no, right? No, no CCTV. No one had a clue, no nothing. I didn't even have a mobile phone. I might have had a mobile phone, possibly. Yeah. No, I don't think I got that until after then. So yeah. you just wouldn't have had it, you know? What was the what was the old Bill like in the case? Well, the initial investigation. Yeah. yeah. So I just don't think they took it serious. You know, they, they investigated me, my wife, my family. Understandably, so I'm yeah. not knocking them for that. They got yeah. to do a thorough job. Um, they... The investigation went along line, you know, are you in debt with money lenders, yeah. you know, money sharks? Are you in debt? Are you having an affair? You know, checking me and my wife out. Yeah. you into drugs. You're into this. You're into that. Any of that. And it just kept coming back with a blank. And then um, a guy called Mick Clark, who was CID at the time locally to us, he um, he took the case on. He was brilliant. Yeah. I mean, he was just absolutely, he, he got me. He realised, listen, this fella's nothing to do with this world, you know. And he come around, he sat with me. This is, I don't know. Four or five days in, um, into the after into the actual investigation, and he said, "Listen, he said, I think you got to put it down as a bad day at the office." He said, "There's nothing out there. All their little grasses and things like that they have their informants. Mm. Um, just everything went quiet." And he said, at the time, I remember him saying, "If Darren Barden was a somebody, we would have heard about it yeah. via one source or another. It would have been Darren Barden's been done, but that world didn't know Darren Barden, so because I, I weren't part of it." And that's when it, you're like, right, so now I'm back to the drawing, you know, drawing board. Where do I go from here? What was the, what was the, what was your mindset like? Were you, to, were you like massively properly angry going, I'm going to, I'm going to need to find these people, I need to hunt them down? Or what was, what was going through the mind? Or were you like, I need to get away from this area, I don't want anything to do with anything? Um, scared. Yeah. I actually just scared. I think the, um, I'm trying to remember back, I mean, it was a lot of years ago. And for me, yeah, it was just being scared. You know, you looking over your shoulder. There was a spell a little while after when my mental health was impacted massively. We'll cover that in a bit. But there was a little spell where I suddenly thought I was invincible, right? It's a stupid reaction. It's, you know, when I look back, I could see a police car driving the other way and I'd take my seatbelt off going, go on, arrest yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's absolutely ridiculous. But that's, it, it was that I just went nuts for a while, like, mm. you know, absolutely nuts. But I think scared was probably the large part of it in the initial stages, you know, Um Beyond that, it was a bit. It was a bit like man up. You got a young kid at home. You got a wife. You got to go back to work, and you just got to get on with life normally, you know. And you sort of had to suppress everything, 
mm. which was where the problem began, yeah. which came out some years later. Yeah. So, which then, when we get to later on, obviously that's that's the hardest part. Did you move back to the same house? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So I stayed with my mum and dad for about nine months. They paid for a trip to for me, my wife, family, and my sister and her husband. We went to Spain for a week. Then I went out to Holland for a week, just stay with friends, just to keep me away from everything, while it was all going on. But then about nine months later, it weren't great. You know, husband and wife and a one-year-old living with your mother and father, yeah. like, you know, it weren't great. And you were so, living with your mum and dad because you didn't want to move back into the house? Yeah, basically, yeah. Okay. The timing had to be right. And it was, okay. I couldn't tell you the date. Yeah. But a strange thing happened. Um, it's, it's sort of a funny story, but it's not at the time. But on the day we moved back, now bearing in mind, no mobile phones. I have to keep emphasising that how long ago it was. So we've got a phone by the side of the bed. We moved back in and this is my first night back in the house. And midnight, bearing in mind, I weren't sleeping. My yeah. wife was, I wasn't. Yeah. The phone rang. Mm. And no one phoned you at midnight. My stabbing was at midnight, mm. you know, less than a year ago. And I picked it up, said hello, and it was just silent for a bit. And then they hung up. So I was like, shit, they're coming back. Mm. You know, that's because I've just, it's my first night back. Mm. So I then phoned uh, CID, Mick Clark, and said, listen, I've had this. Um, got the number from 141, mm. I think mm. he used to do then. And he then got the number and it turned out basically what it was. There was a guy at work who used to do a night shift mm. and he was seeing another girl on the quiet in his lunch break at night and he phoned my number by mistake. So they went and raided his work, turned up mob-handed thinking... <laughs> this poor He's got red-handed. <laughs> he, had, he had some explaining to do. So uh, I've never wanted to know his name just in case. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it just turned out he, he just dialed my number by mistake. With the investigation, with the old bill, obviously they had to come after you, not come after you, but ask yeah. you a load of questions. Yeah. Are you caught up in any noughties? Are you, have you been naughty in your time? Are you caught in drugs, violence, whatever it may yeah. be? It's no, 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 no. What was the investigation like on trying to find those four fellas in your experience? In my experience, I don't think it's good. I don't think it's particularly good. Um, you know, there was a there was another stabbing on on the same night, um, which uh, is a funny enough, it's got a drink with now. We just met each other just coincidentally. We had we was actually stabbed on the very same night, completely separate incidents, just coincidence. But a few days later, there was a, a guy locally that was uh, stabbed and killed um, by. Uh, com I think it was Combat 18 at the time, the football hooligans, and straight away, because it was a killing and it was like mine was a, a yeah. professional hit, they yeah. connected the two. Yeah. And I was be, like, as a Chelsea fan, I'd be gutted if I was done by Combat 18. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you, know <it's> a <laughs> you get the old Chelsea head up on them. Be... Exactly, you know yeah. what I mean? So, uh, yeah, so that was, but obviously it comes to nothing and yeah. it's just, and basically, I think it got, it sort of got dropped, you know, I don't think they. Did you, was there a part of you wanted it to get dropped? Or was a part of you going, no, I'm going to fight this through. I'm going to keep going and putting pressure and putting pressure and putting pressure until we get our answers? No, I turned my attention to um, the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board because I started working with victim support or they were working with me uh, on my mental health, finding me out what I was allowed. Because bearing in mind, I was due to start a new job the following day. You know, so that's gone. I'm now out of work. You know, I've never been out of work in my yeah. life. I've never claimed any benefits. Um, so my anger turned to people I could take it out on yeah. because I had no one to take it out and on. And who was that? So that was the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board because they treated me like a scumbag. You know, okay. that was a, out of all the experiences you go through uh, when you have things like this happen, that was the worst. You know, you know, to sit in a courtroom scenario trying to claim loss of earnings. Yeah. That's all I was doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I weren't, weren't trying to get much and how they treated me and my wife was horrendous. It was vile at the time, you know. Um, I'll, I'll never forget the day, you know, that's... That. When you say they treated you badly, what do you mean by that? So, first of all, you've got to go, it's weeks and weeks and weeks. There's, things may have changed now, you know, so things might be different now. But back then, you had three grades of payment, right? One was about 2000 one was 5000 then one was 20000 Now, in my world, I'm thinking, this is quite bad, 20 on stab Give wounds. Give me 20. I think I yeah. deserve 20. Yeah. So, but I weren't chasing the money. And this is the thing, it weren't, I mean, I needed the money, mm. but, you know, because we were proper skin. But mm. for me, it was, I, I wanted the acknowledgement. I needed someone to go, you know what? That was really bad. Yeah. Because the police hadn't done that. They hadn't gone, they just sort of, I don't know, it, it sort of disappeared a little bit, yeah. you know? And I was then just got back to work and so on. So this fight became my main fight. 
because I had someone to target the energy into, yeah. you know, and to sit there and I, you paperwork after paperwork after paperwork. And then they gave me an interim payment of 2000. Um, now at the time, I think I'd lost about 8,000 in wages yeah. being off, you know, six, seven months. Are you in the same room clocking the people? Again, you got two grand or 10 grand or 20 grand. Just give me 20 grand for God's yeah. sake. Oh, yeah. What are you not mucking about? I've just been done 20 times, stabbed yeah. all over the place. Give me 20 Gs and I'll walk. And yeah. I, I'm happy, you're happy. There's no skin off your nose. It, it's, it's Where's the thing, money come from? You say, but, does the money come from a, uh, from the government? Yeah, so it's a pot. It is a government. I think it's a government-run thing. It's a pot. Whether they take it from criminal, you know, um, like claimed criminal activity or not, and it goes into a pot, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. But I sat there. You've got to imagine you're in a huge room, like a classroom size. Yeah. And they gave me and my wife a small school table with two plastic chairs. And they said to my wife, you do not speak. You do not say anything. If you say anything, you'll be ejected from the room. Down this side of the room, there was three people, all spaced out, like loads of space between mm. them. They were part of the Criminal Injuries Compensation Board. And then across the back side, there was the Right Honourable Eric Stockdale, who was, I don't know what he was Right Honourable for, but that's, that was his title. <laughs> so uh, then there was a guy called Dr. Pinto. It was a uh, some sort of psychologist guy, wrote five books. Uh, and then there was a woman, I don't know who she was, sitting there and bearing in mind they've got the whole um i can't remember what you call it now um your folder basically the whole the file yeah the or, file yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so they've been through all of that and they said to me they went back for all my books because i was a self-employed driver mm. so i was claiming loss of earnings of eight thousand. that's mm. all i was claiming for mm. i weren't claiming compensation mm. just actually loss of earnings and um anyway I went back through my books and i realized i'd submitted an invoice but well, bearing in mind this was october when i had the stabbing my wife su submitted the books in the January, so she wasn't on top of a game, yeah. like, you know. So she um, she submitted the books, and what we'd done, we'd submitted this invoice, put it all in the books, but I hadn't put it down from a tax point of view. Mm. So apparently I owed the tax man £187 pound and, um, of unpaid tax, mm. right? So anyway, they weren't concentrating on 20-odd stab wounds, yeah. the mental health side of things, the overall impact of all my family. What they concentrated on was I hadn't paid all my tax, mm. 187 quid. Mm. And this right honourable Eric Stockdale said to me, um, he said, right, he said, upon assessment, he said, I think you've uh, been quite lucky. We've given you 2000 already because non-payment of tax is a criminal offence and we don't give money to criminals. You're joking. That's, that's how they left me, sitting there, right? The table was shaking. I was, this point. Frothing, right? Oh, my God, yeah, yeah. You know, and bearing in mind, this is, we're talking probably two and a half years on. Yeah. From the stabbing, somewhere like that. You know, so it's, it, it took a long while to get yeah. there. And I was... Yeah, furious yeah. right and he looked down at his book and i saw look he looked up over the top of his glasses and he went anything else like <laughs> another oh, 18 oh my god yeah you know <laughs> i was just i mean i went i went to appeal i was i was the first ever case in the uk yeah. to take the criminal injuries compensation board to, to a court. parliamentary ombudsman you're fighting government versus government you're never going to win mm. but it made me feel better you know so but i ended up getting five grand in total um i think it's five grand oh no seven and a half thousand seven i got and, and then about five years after I think they gave my wife a thousand pound because she was obviously in the house. I've got, at the to, time. Say, I've got to say, mate, what is a, that's a proper piss take. Oh my god, mate! It's like shit, when I look know. back now, you're telling me this story is the first time I've heard it. Yeah, I want to roll back a bit further. Yeah, like you, you spoke about the word mental health. Yeah, now mental health touted around everywhere these last two, three Absolutely. years. When you were about, there wasn't the internet. Yeah, people didn't know what mental health was. People were just like you mentioned a minute ago, just crack on. Yeah, deal with it. Whatever. Da da da. What? struggles did you go through post attack i think not a lot i think not a lot um i think because you're a bloke yeah right you've got a wife and a young family and went to see me doctor i went to see a psychiatrist um first of all I went to see a counselor and you're going to see the counselor and you know i don't know why i was there you know i felt i was going there because i thought it might help a compensation claim yeah. you know i didn't feel there's anything wrong with me yeah. I'm still trying to be a boy, like, you know, here I am, you know, I've got a fem for my family. Yeah. The counsellor quickly realised, you know, I was in trouble up there. And so they put me in front of a psych, uh, psych psychiatrist. Mm. Um, and I made a joke one day, I just said to the psychiatrist, I said, listen, you know, I, she asked me about my sleep. I said, I tend to sleep, like, you know, after a few beers or maybe some sex, like, mm. you know. So I said, maybe I should be a, like an alcoholic raving nymphomaniac. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so she, I said, I'll be all right then, yeah. like, you know. And she was like... I don't think you're taking it serious, yeah. like, you know, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. which I wasn't, and mm. I didn't. You know, I had about three or four sessions with these, and I was like... You just said a minute ago that you weren't right up there. Yeah. What was wrong, do you think? I think anger. 
Anger, okay. I think anger, yeah. Okay, definitely. so the emotion anger was still floating around. Yeah. And, and was it anger because the old bill didn't catch those four lads? Was the anger that you got attacked for no specific reason? Was the anger because you didn't get 20 grand? What Was it a combination of everything? Combination of everything. But I think more importantly, the impact it had on my wife. That's where yeah. I think the anger come from because she had to come down those stairs and see her husband bleeding to death, yeah. you know, uh, with a one-year-old. And there's a little moment um, which... You know, she sat on the set A and, you know, she's just in complete shock. Yeah. I'm sat there bleeding to death and we're waiting for the ambulance to turn up. And my son, who was one at the time, he's, I'm doing this. I'm trying to keep the blood from pouring in my eyes because it's just gushing out mm. of my head constantly. And as I'm doing this, my son thought I was playing peekaboo. Mm. So he's then going like this yeah. way, sitting there. And I'm, I'm now having to do peekaboo. Yeah. I'm on death's door. Mm. I'm doing peekaboo with a one-year-old, you know. And, you know, in, in her world, she's witnessed all of this, mm. you know. So I lived it, but she witnessed it, mm. you know, the actual immediate aftermath. Yeah. So I was anger because, you know, I was incontrollable with my emotions. Yeah. You know, I weren't in control of them. And she was on the wrong end of it all the time. You know, like I didn't do anything physical or verbal and things like that. But it's just, I just couldn't control myself. Yeah. You know, I, I could sit and watch an episode of The Bill and suddenly the emotion would come over me. And I'll just be sobbing my eye out, yeah. you know, and then I'll get angry myself. I mean, the names I've called myself and the stuff I've done to myself, you just, you know, I just, I couldn't control it. Do you feel like you've mentally tortured yourself for a load of years post the stabbing? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, there's, listen, whoever they were after, you know, has, got, has had a lucky result. You know, yeah. whether they've ever been caught and yeah. done eventually. But you know what? I knew it weren't me right from day one. Whatever happened, it weren't about me. And that's always been my saving grace. Because I've never, ever been bothered by catching someone. Because yeah. I don't know what it's going to achieve. Especially now, mm. you know, 20 odd years on, I don't I don't know what it's going to achieve. You know, say they walk in here now and say, well, by the way, it was us. My world don't change. For my mum and dad and Wendy, yeah. it changes dramatically. Yeah. Because then they got someone to target, you know. So, How did your mum, how's your mum and dad been these past 20 years with this? Because if that was my little boy, whether you were 29 mm. or 50 odd now, you're still my little boy. Yeah. And I don't want to see my little boy been beaten up, hurt, anger. And for, as a parent looking in, you're going to go through all this emotion as a parent. And it's pretty difficult to try to put that under the carpet. Yeah. I think for different reasons, mums and dads yeah. react differently. Yeah. Um, Mum, probably because you are still a little boy. You know, dad, because he grew up in the East End of London, you know, lorry driver. Done Tough. His, yeah, you yeah. know, they, they used to fight a lot yeah. and things like that, yeah. you know. So he'd want someone to pay for it. He's 75 now, you know, and he'll go to his grave never being able to make someone pay for it. Mm. And that eats away at him constantly. Mm. And whenever I do things like this, yeah. I try and say, look, I'm all right. I'm yeah. doing all right for myself, you know, which I am. You know, I'm in the best place I've ever been now. But there's still no one being made to pay for it. Mm. You know, and it, I mean, mum's side of it, I think the same thing. No one to pay for it, but she still worries because of the depression all those years after. They know it's never gone away. Mm. And it probably hasn't, you know, at the moment, you know, I'm in a great place, mm. you know, where I am now, but from a mental point of view, but it's still going to be there, you know, for their point of view. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting, the older generation haven't got the accessibility to we've got to work out what depression is or what anger is or whatever it may be. Yeah. They may be holding on to that for the rest of their life, but the pain in them to the day they go. Oh, 100%. Yeah, okay. Yeah, 100%. It, it eats away at my wife. Yeah. Yeah, she always, always. Your current won. wife now? Current wife. She's Wendy? been my wife 30 odd years, yet, yeah. So she's, Lovely lady. She was sitting there at the time. I'll, I'll yeah. call her my current wife now, yeah. so she don't buck a game up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to roll back a little bit further as well. Yeah. We talk about trauma. Yeah. And a lot of people we've had on the podcast who have been who have had trauma as a kid, and have done the naughty stuff that they've done, haven't dealt with the trauma as a kid. Yeah, I want to go to your one year old. Yeah, for him seeing that, there'll be somewhere stuck in his mind of that vision. Have you had that conversation with him, or is it no under so the carpet? We, but we, I had the conversation. So what happened was, and I remember the day. My wife used to work Saturday mornings at the bank, and we went over to get a haircut. And he was stood behind me. He was eight years old. And as he stood behind me, so the scar in my back, we'd always, with both the kids, we'd always gone, this is why you don't run with scissors. This is why you don't play with knives. I mean, now you think I can do this. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. but it was a story we used, you know. So we always said to the kids, you don't play with knives, don't play with scissors, because that's what yeah. happens. 
or a good or a good chat up line around birds. Shark attack. Yeah, shark, shark attack. attack. <laughs> Absolutely. Fended him off. <laughs> you, you should have seen him. You should have seen, yeah. yeah. Free sharks. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so I'm, st- I'm sat in the barber chair yeah. and um my son stood behind me and all of a sudden he's like where well, I've had my hair short, he's like, Where's what's yeah. that scar in the back of your head then? Yeah. Like, you know? Oh no, sorry, when we got in the car to go and pick my wife up, he said, Dad, what was that mark on the back mm. of your head? I said, What mark? He said, There's like a scar. So I said, Listen, son, you know we've always told you about, yeah. you know, the bloke don't play with knives. And I just told him the story. Mm. Just said, This is what happened. So you told him, eight years old, I got attacked. Yeah, absolutely. You yeah. didn't go into so, brutality, I would not imagine. The whole lot, no, that sort of you build old, up over time. How old's your son today? Uh, twenty seven. Does your, if you ask your son today at 27, do you remember what happened when you were one years old? Will he remember anything? I doubt it. I doubt okay. it. We, we, I would say that's a subject we, I've never asked that question. So I might go back and ask it actually, mm. see what he says. So, I would uh, be, I'd be really yeah. interested yeah. because, yeah, you just, you just don't know that something could be maybe holding him back in future. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I'm not a psychologist. No, or me whatever. either, yeah. But I'm, but I'm, I'm for the matter of, conversations I've had on podcasts, if that trauma's not dealt with as a young child, you can't move forward as an adult. And I'll be intrigued to find it, because I can't remember being one years old or two no. years old. For, apart from photos when you're four and five, you kind of have that. I don't remember being one. Yeah. I'll be intrigued to find out if he... Yeah. I mean, I, I, f- I wouldn't mind. It wouldn't bother us now. We, one of the things we've learned in our house, because yeah. of my depression all the years after, was we now learn to talk yeah. and we open up. Yeah. So we absolutely will say to each other, you know, if there's a problem, we'll, we'll chat, you know. So if I ask the question, it'd give me the answer. Yeah. You know, whether it's just be, no, I don't remember it. I don't know. You said you had depression. What does depression mean to you? That's really strange because that's the question. When I do my talks, that's one of the questions I ask people. What does it mean to you? Um, one of the best answers I ever had was from a 12-year-old. And it's sort of, is how I would describe it as well. Um, this 12-year-old I'd never met before. I was doing a talk at a school and... He said, depression's like being in a cardboard box with the lid closed and just a little hole to look out of. And I think that's it. Wow. If I, even now, if someone said to me, go through the depression again or go through the stabbing again, what one would you do? I would go through the stabbing again. The depression is a thousand times worse. Like it's, you know, bearing in mind we're talking, we don't know the actual dates, but somewhere around 12 to 14 years after my stabbing is when I went through the depression. Is that right? So it, t- it took a good 12, 14 yeah. years for it to kick in. Absolutely. We now know it as PTSD. Yeah. You know, we don't, we didn't know that then, yeah. you know, so, and I certainly didn't even think it was depression, you know, but I was on a downward spiral. Um, you know, there was lots of strange things happening. I started to make up stories in my head. Uh, I was diagnosed with something called catastrophic thinking, which apparently is a real thing. Um, I always think the word catastrophic sounds a bit funny, yeah. but, uh, you know, it's, yeah. uh, so it, I started making things up like, right, okay, so my wife's having an affair. Right, yeah. and I know it is, yeah. and like so. Then I try catching her out. Yeah, like none, none of this is going on. It's just all in your head, yeah. you know. So she was then getting into work, like having to leave because I'd know it took seven minutes to go from her work to home, yeah. and like if she weren't in, in seven minutes, you'd think she's. I'd be off on one, like yeah, you know okay. what I mean. So she's had to deal with all of that as well, and it's that side of things was vile. You know, I went, I, I turned up one day in secret, and I put a rose on a car with a little message from your secret lover just to find out if she just told to me say, or not. Yeah. I mean, what a fucking idiot. Yeah. You know what I mean? I was horrible. She, you know, she's the greatest woman. She's the reason I'm sitting here now. Yeah. You know, to think I've done all of that shit, I, it's, it's not right. So depression actually, within depression, are you saying paranoia kicked in as well? Yeah, a paran- bit of paranoia. Yeah. Definitely the catastrophic thinking. So I could quite easily walk down the street and think, that's a bit windy, that lamppost going to not only fall over and hit me, but it's going to hit that car. That car's going to go over there. You, oh you make all this shit up, you know? Wow. And it's, it, So what I developed was, I developed, um, and this is where I ended up getting to the stage where I was on the verge of taking my own life. So... Oh, this is yeah, serious. You were on the verge of taking your own life. Yep. What year was this? Uh, I would say around eight years ago. So maybe nine. So you were 45. Yeah. And the stabbing yeah. happened when you were 29. 29, yeah. So roughly 15, 16 years on. Yeah. You then got to a point where I want to take my own life. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Bloody hell. And what I decided I was going to do, I hadn't decided how I was going to take my own life. I hadn't worked that out, whether it's going to be a train, whether it's going to be jumping off a bridge. or I hadn't got into that detail, but what I did know was when it happens, I knew exactly how everybody was going to react. I knew, right, my wife would be back to work in two weeks, two days. And this was all going on in yeah. my head. I knew the kids would be doing, right, this is what how their world will change. This is how my mum and dad's world will change. So I, I mapped it all out. But then I started thinking, right, those people there, those guys there, they know no woman on her own with two kids. Yeah. They're now going to start befriending her. Yeah. 
I then developed a hatred of people. When I say hatred, like I wanted to hurt these people, and they hadn't done fuck all. Yeah. They hadn't done anything. This is all in my head. Yeah. So I, I then started getting the paranoia coming in. Right. So I, when I went to a party with Wendy's work, I'd be watching them. Like, and like when I say watching them, like, like as in really probably staring them and yeah. going, go on, make your move. Let's see if you're doing anything different, yeah. you know, because cause I weren't all the ticket. Yeah. You know, and and that side of it, when you look back on it, yeah, it breaks my heart. I think that's what I've done to Wendy. You know what I mean? I don't even know why she's still here. Like, you know, mm. so it's, it's, you know, and that, that was daily. That was daily, you know. Was that daily Was that daily from the age of 29 to 45? No. Or do, I, I want to know what, why it kicked in so much later. Like you're saying that it was 15, 16 years on from the stabbing. And it was around that period you want to take your own life. You're getting aggy with people, staring people out, seeing who's looking at your missus, yep. see who's going to take you on. You were ready. Uh, you're probably preempting what you would do to them. Yeah, no absolutely. Doubt. Yeah, absolutely. It was. Yeah. I, I, I'm intrigued. The why it's taken. So, from what I can work out from the doctors and the counsellors yeah. and the, the you know the coaching I've had is that when you have a trauma, quite often you can suppress this trauma. Yeah. Right. So your brain's got a capacity, and the brain's a magnificent, magnificent yeah. thing. So I suppressed the trauma. Yep. So I've kept it there. And then as I got into normal life, you know, going to work, earning your wage, paying your bills, going football, golf, whatever it may have been, life just carried on. And all the time this was sitting there. And I got to a stage in life where actually Wendy was doing all right at work. Excuse me. The kids were doing okay. Um, we both got jobs, driving and so yeah. on. And suddenly you're a little bit surplus to requirements. Yeah. Okay. And it, it's, it's a common trait between guys of, say, 45 to 52. Yeah where they do suffer depression. Yeah. Now, from my point of view, it wasn't a common thing. It was actually because of PTSD. So what I'd then done, I had a bit of space in the brain, at the front of the brain, where they can go, right, I'll tell you what, remember that shit that happened to you years ago? Yeah. Let's Bring put that on your plate. Yeah. Bloody so, hell. and that's the simplest way of explaining it. You know, depression's a, you know, some people disagree with this, but it's a chemical imbalance in the brain. Mm. So where we go along with life, up and down, you know, when you have a very big high, you're up here. When you have a big low, you're down there. Well, mine was like that yeah. constantly. You know, I, they, I weren't sitting in the middle. Yeah. So I was either full on happy or very, very low, like, you know. Mm. So and the low was constantly low. Were you, you were you boozing? Yeah, too much. Were you using drugs? No, absolutely not. No, no drugs. No, no I always stayed booze. away from drugs, yeah. So just booze. So would you go into that depression and go, you know what, I'm just going to get larrups, I'm just going to drink. What, what was your drink of choice? Was it oh, lager? Just, was it whiskey? I'm, lager, it I'm a lager man. Lager so, man. Yeah, okay. so, but I didn't drink indoors. Never really been a big drinker indoors. I always went to the pub. Yeah. And I think I was escaping. Yeah. You know, I was escaping me more than anything. Or suppressing but, the pain. Absolutely. So, mm. but I'd get into a pub on a Friday afternoon. I could be in a pub at two o'clock on a Friday and we would have 15, 16 pints of lager. <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> That's what it was like. Yeah, yeah. you could, yeah. you know, and yeah, yeah. I'd still be home by nine o'clock, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, um, but I was doing that on a Tuesday. I was doing it on a okay. Thursday. So it started creeping, the midweek started creeping yeah. in as well. And we didn't have the money. I was yeah. skin, you know, yeah. spending money I didn't have, you know. And the whole time, Wendy's, she's looking after the kids, looking yeah. after our world, and I'm just destroying everything. Were you getting into debt? Yeah. So you were getting into debt. You were suppressing the feelings by getting pissed up in the week. Yep. Yeah. And then your mind started going, do Lally, thinking my miss is up to something or my mate's up to something, who's looking? Yeah, I was, wow, I was a mess, man. absolute wow. mess. Where was, what, what was the point? Was there ever a point when you said, today's the day I'm going to take my life? No, no, no I didn't get okay. to that actual stage. Okay. So I, I didn't know what how I wanted to do it. I'd always been, one of my friends, his dad was a tr tube driver yeah. and it had someone jump in front of the tube and I'd always thought, that's an horrible thing to do. You know, that driver's got to live with that. So I was never going to do it in a tube, yeah. like, you know. So but I thought about these things. It seems stupid now when you look back on it. But I sort of knew what I didn't want to do. And I didn't want, say, like, my wife and kids to be finding me. Yeah. So I knew that type of stuff, what weren't going to happen, but I didn't know how it was going to happen. Mm. But to even go down that route, yeah. you know, thinking, right, this, I need to terminate myself, you know. Mm. And, Jesus. you know, now when, you, when I hear the stories and I see it all the time, you know, which is the work I do now, you know, yeah. I don't... You know, the suicide prevention stuff I do. I'm not trained. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not yeah. a doctor. I do it through lived-in experience. But you've been there and got the T-shirt. Oh, and absolutely. What's going yeah. through the mind. Yeah, absolutely. What advice would you give to someone today, knowing knowing what you've gone through, getting into debt, more yeah. alcohol, thinking about how you're going to take your life? What advice would you give to Because the biggest suicide rate in our country at the moment is between the 40 and 50-year-olds. Yeah. And I think there's 5,000 suicides a year. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I work in the construction industry, yeah. so I supply the construction industry. And there's there's two deaths, suicide deaths, every day in the construction industry, every working day. You know, if that was a fall from a scaffold, they'd shut sites down. Yeah. But there's two people taking their lives every single working day. You know, in the construction industry, and I think we got we got to do more. Yeah. And also in this country, we do something. A figure we work out around is one in four people yeah. have an issue with mental health. Yeah. Now, I think it's more than that. I think it's more than that. I think yeah. It's a lot more than that. But the studies show it's one in four people. Yeah. Now, I used to think, right, this one in four, and I've had it myself, people going to me, reach out. Look, if you need anything, talk, you yeah. know, ask me, you know, come to me for help. Yeah. I can tell you categorically from being in that position, the last thing I'm going to do is tell you I'm weak, is to tell you yeah. I'm struggling. Yeah. I'm not going to do it. I'm a yeah. bloke. It's a We're bloke shit, thing. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I don't, I, I know people are not going to reach out. And mm. you see companies now, they put all these things in there. You know, this, you signposted where to go if you're struggling, you know, which is brilliant. Yeah. But you're not going to reach out because yeah. you're accepting, in your own world, you failed. Yeah. You failed yourself. Well, you ain't going to tell you. Look, the whole thing at the moment is speak to a mate. Speak to a mate. Actually, you don't want to speak to your mate. No. If you're a ge if you're a geezer or, or a bloke or a lad's lad or whatever, yeah. you're, you're going to go to your mates. Yeah. It's a sign of weakness. My, my mate Rob, yeah. we, we used to go out on a walk on a Friday. I, I was lucky enough, I had a job three days a week, mm. so I worked with someone. And um, so on a Friday, we used to go for a nice long walk, seven, eight, ten miles, uh, always end up in a pub, right? And anyway, I wrote about it in the book. And when he was reading the book, it suddenly dawned on him. That's when I was going through this. And he went, how comes I didn't know? Yeah. This guy walked with me for miles and miles, yeah. and hours at a time, spent hours in a pub with me, and never knew I was struggling. Yeah. No one did. No one else outside of Wendy knew. What was, what was so? Going on. You're 45, really struggling. What was your go-to? The internet's about now. You're talking like only eight years ago. We're talking 2015, yep. 2016. What was what was your route to go? Oh, actually, fuck it. I, I need to speak to someone as soon as possible. I need to find out some more information because I've got to sort. I've got to sort my suite out ASAP. I didn't. You didn't. No. So there was a one moment. My wife's um, boss, yeah. uh, Vic. Um, his brother had died quite suddenly, and. It was his day of his funeral, and my wife wanted to text him in the morning, and she just say, you know, listen, I'm thinking of you today, type thing. So she said to me, um, you know, what shall I write? And I was like, I had a doctor's appointment because I had a bit of an, something, an itch on me on me mm. boob there, like you know. And I, I remember wanting to explode her, thinking, yeah. I'm going to the doctors, and you're worried about some bloke we don't even know who's died. You know, I was really horrible, like you know, and that. That moment was my point of thinking, Darren, you're a fucking idiot here. You're a proper idiot. Yeah. And then when I went to the doctors, I sat in the doctors and I said to him, um, as I walked in the room, you, you go in, you push the buttons. And um, at the time you had to do the old, you clean your hands. And and uh, I sat down, I said, right, Darren Bard. And as I walked in, there's another doctor sitting in my doctor's chair. right? And my doctor was sitting here. He said, oh, Darren, just so you know, we're doing training in here today. Um, you know, okay, if you're all right about that. And I just went mad. I mean, you know, we're all right with swearing on here, so yeah. I'll give you an example yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. of how it went. So I went, you what? Fucking trainee doctor. Now, bearing in mind, I'm in a doctor's room, yeah. right? Fucking trainee doctor, I went. Who the fuck are you? I said, tell you what, get yourself up now. Right, you, go and sit in that fucking chair where you belong, mm. right, and you fucking examine me, not some fucking stranger. Mm. I've got an itch on my tit, and I'm fucking nuts. Mm. I said, if I walk out of here now, you're never going to fucking see me again because I'll be dead. Mm. They swap seats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, seriously, I, I've kept phoning the surgery after, apologising. I mean, I was fucking yeah. mental. Like, you know, yeah. I was really, really angry, really angry. Were you a fighter? Nah, not really. No, nah, okay. nah. I've done a bit of karate and. But you, you weren't know. a fighter. So I'm going to take my. I'm going to have a tear up tonight. No, no, no. No, definitely not. No. Right. So um, I want to. I want to find out about your wife. Yep. You've been with her thirty years. Yeah. And she stood by you. Yep. All since the age of twenty nine to where you are now. Yep. What a woman, number one. Yep. And what she must have gone through, and the pain. And the anger and everything yeah. is beyond belief. So massive respect yeah. <laughs> to your wife. I just met her before we come on here in yeah. the green room and uh, huge respect to your wife, Wendy. She's, you know, the, the biggest impact uh, of my world. is She's had that on me, you know. So my mum and dad have been brilliant. My sister, my friends, you know, I've got a yeah. great circle of friends and family, but she lived it. Yeah. She was the only one I knew. Yeah. She, you know, I'd, I'd get up in the middle of the night and I'd be downstairs and we had a coffee table and I'd be walking around it like a lunatic and I'd start kicking furniture, yeah. you know, 
and she'd have to be like, right, sort make sure the kid's in there, come yeah. down, settle me down. You know, there'd be times I'd just be sobbing and there she was, bang, arm around me. Wow. You know, and it's, I don't know, you yeah. know, superwoman, you yeah. know, to to be able to carry on her, in her work mm. as she's did and she's worked well up the ladder there. To be able to bring up a family because I was best part of useless, mm. you know, with the kids. Um, and to maintain our relationship through that is is remarkable. And all of this is from a vicious attack that had nothing to do with you. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, that the impact on Wendy for me mm. is is the biggest thing. You know, you you can't imagine what she felt coming down with a one year old in yeah. her arms, walking through that blood. Oh. But then the next 15, 16, 17, now 20 odd years on to live that, mm. you know, and how vile I was with her, you know, um, we was out one night with her workmates and um, we we're talking about, am I a fighter? No, and this will prove it. Yeah. Um, we was in a nightclub in Epping in Essex called Billy Jeans and um, it got to about midnight and a couple of local unsavory people come in and I was like, made me feel uncomfortable. Mm. So she took me home because I weren't right in the head everyone all her mates went on a minibus and we drove so because she don't drink so anyway she drove me home a year later we're back in the same club and all of a sudden about 10 to 12 or something like that she says to me right do you want to go because it's getting near midnight she said do you want to go i said no, no you're all having a good time it's good atmosphere don't worry about it a free guy's coming and completely off their tits you know mm. like they just walked in didn't buy a drink and you know yourself, you spend a bit of time around pubs, you can clock these people. Yep. They're straight away. They're not they're yep. not right. Yeah. And as I was looking at the three of them at the bar, the one on the left, just I see him say to his mates, watch this. And he started walking around the, the sort of the bar area and around the side. I started thinking he's coming towards me. Mm. And as he came towards me, he pushed Wendy in the back and knocked onto a table. And as she went to get up, he'd done it again. And this was the moment the red mist come over. Yeah. Now this proves I'm not a fighter, right? Wow. As far as I'm concerned, in my my world, I was battering the shit out of this guy. Yeah. You know, I, yeah. I even picked a bottle up, eating with yeah. a bottle. I mean, I was, I probably didn't even eat him. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know, in my lost the plot. plot. Just completely yeah. lost the plot. Wendy hadn't seen what had happened, and so she thought someone had bumped into her, and I'd overreacted. Now, lucky enough, her friend had seen it's the same as me, mm. but this was on a Friday or a Saturday night. Now, Wendy, at this point, hates me. That was the final yeah. straw of her. You know, I'd done it, embarrassed her in front of all the workmates. You know, and this this point, you know, was going to take some getting over. Mm. And I was trying to say, listen, this ain't my fault. The geezer was a twat, mm. you know. Um, I, I then had a row with the bouncers on the way mm. out. And it was, you know, she was getting me out. The, the, these three geezers were back at the bar, just standing there. Yeah. And I'm like, like they're, they're going to give you problems. Yeah, like, you know, so the bouncers got rid of me. Yeah. We got home. And she just didn't speak to me. until When she got to work on a Monday and her friend said to her, exactly what I'd been saying. Yeah. And then, even then though, the anger had set in mm. and I think she'd had so many years day in, day out of putting up with my crap mm. that actually she, she sort of needed the excuse to be able to yeah. have a go at me about so, something yeah, yeah. and that was it. Yeah. And it took a long time to rebuild after that, mm. a long time, you know, but, you know, and she did. Are you still angry today? No, I don't I don't think I am. Um, there's, there's elements of me getting anger. The, the debt, you know, I mean, we touched on the debt earlier um, in the sense of, you know, I was I was just spending money I didn't have. Yeah. You know, I was trying to live a life that I didn't have. And then I, the job changing, you know, I was changing job after job after job. And it was always someone else's fault. Yeah. You know, and I was, everyone say like, they'll give you an extra couple of quid and you go there and think it'd be better. And then it weren't. And then you do something else and go. And she's had to live for all of that. You know, the non-payment, we had bailiffs coming down chasing yeah. us once, you know, and things like that. And, you know, some unsavory people driving around yeah. looking for money like 40 grand off me and things like that and it's so hold on hold on yeah who, who was looking for 40 grand off some you? people in scotland I'd why used, 40 g's because uh, i borrowed it for a business and, okay. and basically just ditched them you know so not deliberately i weren't you know i just weren't mentally stable what you was know? the business so it was just a, a clothing company ppe company so doing high vis clothing for the railway and things like that what year was this uh, roughly 2004 what are we on now? 22, yes, yeah, 2000, somewhere between 2005, 2010, yeah, okay. something like that. Yeah. So you brought 40 Gs off them. Yep. They then were coming after you and you just went on the right, you just hid. Yeah, so what I've done, I sort of ditched that and then started to do another business yeah. with someone else. Um, yeah, and they wanted their money back. Did so, they ever come on top? So, no, no. Nothing at all? No. So it was, it was a few moments. I mean, I had to get the kids picked up from school once because there was a Range Rover sitting outside up the road from with some blokes in it. So there was some stuff Obviously, they weren't happy about yeah. this. Um, you know, it's all those little things Wendy's yeah, had to live with, you know what I mean? And it's also the little mm. things like that, like you go, that's that's 
10 years after you had the thingy bob then yeah. you're paranoid that they're after you're paranoid that they've got a range you set outside the school where you're thinking they're going to attack my kids for 40 years your mind must have been I was fucked up yeah. you know and it's the thing is you yeah. seem like in a really good place today like we've been having conversations over the last month we got introduced uh, yeah. for, uh, for a virtual um, for, for a friend of ours you seem like in a really good place as we sit today. It's I'm in the best place. Listen, it's it's not been easy. No. So even if you go back a year, yeah. I had a bit of a wobble out. Yeah. But different scenarios, I can see the signs. Yeah. So phone the doctors, get the tablets. You know, so you go right, get that chemical balance, imbalance back yeah. in. But I'm in I'm in the best form of my life. Yeah. You know, I'm on top form. Yeah. Uh, the stuff I'm working on now. So to link it to everything we've said. Yeah. You know, for me, the greatest reward in life is is helping other people yeah. now. You know, I, I I wouldn't have believed that first. And I'm going to tell you a little story with the book. So, so just, just uh, the book, yeah, on, what's yeah. the book called? Uh, let's skip to the good bits. Let's have a look. Yep. So there we go. Let's skip to the good bits. Everyone, take a look at that. Make sure you go and have a look. So and that and when did you write that book? Uh, that was now four and a half years ago. I've a completed. shocking account of a brutal knife attack and the courageous twenty year battle to get one man's life back. That is powerful. It, Listen, I mean, every word in there I wrote. Yeah. But when I wrote the book, I didn't know what I was doing with it. Yeah. I'm not an academic. Yeah. You know, you can probably tell. But you you've know, written from the heart. It, that is it. That yeah. is me pouring it out. Yeah. You know, the tears I shed writing that, you just wouldn't believe. How are you helping people today? What's your world today, Darren? Well, something happened around the book. Yeah. So I, I started work with a guy um, and I helped him through his first six months, nine months, 12 months, just generally helping him out. I didn't know him before that. And anyway, he then done a long journey to come to my book launch mm. I said blimey mate like you know he said no look he said you help me he said I'll come to help you and it's all, uh, April the 12th uh, on a Thursday night my book launch and um, 2022 so yeah yeah, yeah so yeah it would have been no uh, no 20 18 17 it's okay. four and a half years before, ago okay, yeah, four okay. And a half before, years ago so, before the pandemic yeah before okay. the pandemic yeah so he's driven all this way and he said no look you help me through that he said I'm going to support you on this so bearing in mind he's done a three hour journey right, from Bristol to where I live, Harlow, um, to come and help me with my book launch. And I'm like, I was over the moon with this. Um, that was on a Thursday night, and this is the important part. So on the Saturday morning, he starts texting me. I mean, you can see by the book, it's not the biggest book in the world, you know. And he started saying, look, I've read the book. And he said, I want to tell you my story. He said, I was beaten as a child. He said, by my dad. My mum was beaten by my dad. And in my adult life, I've had some serious bouts of anger and depression. Mm. He said, but I've read your book. He said, I'm going to go and get myself sorted. And I was like, oh, fucking hell, life. If I do nothing else in life, yeah. I feel like I've achieved yeah. something. So that was in the April. About May time, he's, you know, I got a message through through someone from his wife saying, thank you, she's got her husband back. Mm. And I'm like, fucking hell, Brilliant. this is great. Fast forward to January after, and I met up with him again, and he said to me, I need to tell you my story. So I said, uh, no, you've already done it, mate. Like, you know, we was up in Manchester on a conference. And he said, uh, no, no, he said, I need to tell you the real story. I said, all right. So he said, uh, April the 12th was your book launch. Now, even the wife and kids don't remember my book launch, you know, the day mm. I do, but yeah. uh, so he does. And the reason was, and he said, look, I was beaten by my dad. My mum was beaten. Mm. They went through it. I said, listen, you ain't got to cover it again. He said, no, no. He said, the reason I know, he said, I had my suicide notes written to my wife and kids. He said, I had a stash of pills, a stash of drink, and I was taking my own life that weekend. Right? He knew how he was doing it. He knew where he was doing it. And he was ending his own life that weekend. And he read me book. Wow. And now he lives a happy and fruitful life now. Wow. You know, whenever we see each other, you know, he'll be watching this with pride. Yeah. You know, whenever we see each other every now and then, we don't tell everybody, mm. you know, that's why I won't ever give his name out. Mm. You know, we know what yeah. happened. And it weren't about me. It weren't yeah. about, oh, I saved him. Yeah. It was about just that timing. Yeah. And I started to think, well, if I can do that, mm. why can't I do that a bit more? You know, it hasn't cost me anything. Oh, yeah, I wrote a book and all that mm. sort of stuff. You never make money out of books. Mm. But... You know, that's it's such a rewarding yeah. feeling. And I could give you 15, maybe even 20 stories like that now, wow. you know, where people were right in desperate need, you know, struggled, read the book, or they've spoken to me, and I've helped them one way or another. If there's someone out there listening right now yeah. who's really struggling with their mind health, yeah, I like to call it mind health rather than mental health because of the connotations Actually, like that. it was as I like a kid, that. Yeah, you know? Absolutely. Um, if you were the mental kid at school, you were the one, in the, you know. Yeah. But So if someone's struggling with their mind health right now, and they're thinking real dark thoughts about yep. taking their life. And they're thinking about leaving their kids behind, their families behind, da, da, da. What advice could you give them right now? It's really hard because of what I said earlier. Now, I could give them all the advice in the world to speak to someone. 
And that's the most important thing, whether it's a mate in a pub, whether it's a workmate, whether it's your boss, you know, your wife, your partner, you know, um, husband. For me, speaking out is one of the greatest things you can do. It does help massively. However, going back to that one in four scenario we have in the UK, that means there's three in four people to look out for the one in four. Yeah. And that's what I focus on now. You know, you're in a group of mates, the majority of you are going through life fairly hunky dory yeah. you know, and suddenly that one guy, one girl, is not in the WhatsApp chat as, mm. as much. They don't come out on a Friday. You know, suddenly you've heard they borrowed some money from someone, 40 quid here, 20 quid yeah. there. That's when you've got to step up. As one, of, as one of those three and four people, go and ask them, are they okay? Yeah. You know, say to them, are you okay? Everything okay? Chances are they're going to go, yeah, no problem. Yeah. It's all fine. Ask again. Yeah. And then ask again. Yeah. And keep asking because that saves lives. Yeah. That genuinely saves lives. And for me, that's where my focus is, is on the three and four people helping the one in four. Because the one in four is not going to listen to me. Yeah. Won't listen to you. I hope they do. And I clearly know they do because of the book, you know, the mm. impact it had on people. But generally speaking, I know through lived in experience, yeah. they're not going to reach out. Yeah. They very rarely do, which is why you end up with the suicide rates that we got. You know, so three and four people look out for that one in four. Yeah. It's absolutely vital. That's unbelievable. That's fantastic yeah. advice, Darren. Yeah, Darren, I've really, really enjoyed this episode. <laughs> I really thank you for your honesty yeah. and and looking back for all the years, what you've gone through from that brutal attack for no apparent reason to where you are now. You seem like in a really good place today. It's you know what? It's the best I've been for many years, and yeah. the part part of the reason is I can see if. Like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, there's yeah. a future, not just in my world, yeah. you know, some of the stuff I'm working on now. So I've created an online training course uh, for salespeople, but it's it's more, not only sales training, but it's sales training with the, the mind health side of yeah. things built into, I'm going to keep using yeah. that now, thank you for that. <laughs> so the mind health side of things where, you know, in sales, you're three times more likely to suffer with anxiety and depression than the national average. In construction, you're three times more likely than the national average. You know, so for me, why not help these people? You know, why not give them an insight as in where I was, the job hopping and the financial problems yeah. and actually coach them. If they do the right thing, yeah. they don't have to live that route. Yeah. So I've created an online training course, which I'm very proud What's of. What's that called? It's going to be called Six Pillar Sales and Confidence Creator. Um, we're going to launch that hopefully the end of February. Yeah. Just be an online course. We're going to do a free version first yeah. um, and launch that. Because I, I, I enjoy doing my job. I enjoy my work. So I don't yeah. particularly want to give that up yet. Yeah. I've now written a second book. Yeah. Uh, just start literally. You just got started. a name for the second book? No, yeah. We, we're not sure where it's going to okay. be. Uh, Out of the Blue was one of them. Yeah. Um, but it's more the positive impacts I yeah. can have on the world now. I uh, do quite a bit with um, a charity called Ian's Chain, which is a suicide prevention charity. Uh, which What's is, that called? Ian's Chain? Ian's Chain, yes. My friend Alan, his son took his own life when he was 23. And that was 10 years ago, this Christmas. And he took so, his own life at 23. 23, yeah. Do they so, know why? No. And that's, that's one of the things, the ripple effect of suicide. And when you look at my world, you know, the stabbing and all that, this is something that's impacted me, not by choice. You know, this is something that was put on me. Yeah. And then I end up in a suicidal position, yeah. which then if I'd have taken my own life, the impact is greater. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so when these people are out there, you know, doing the stuff they do, you know, whether it's professional hits on people like me or bullying, you know, there's a massive, you're not just impacting yeah. that one person. There's yeah. a huge impact yeah. that goes on forever. Yeah. You know, that's a, that's a proper life sentence, you know, so. Darren, I see a nice cup there. Tell me yes, what cup's about. Yes, so uh, last week up at work, they created a cup called, uh, they've done it in conjunction with my height, by the way, <laughs> so short and stumpy. So, uh, but yeah, it's called the Legacy Cup and it's because of the work I do within work and also outside of work um, and hopefully leave a legacy. Yeah. You know, and that's one of the things I want to do. I want to create a sales academy that helps people with mind health as well. Yeah. So I'm just loving that phrase, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, so I've just won that last week. I'd also won an award a couple of years ago called um, uh, the Extra Mile Award. Yeah. I didn't realise how many people I'd impacted. And it's not about like, oh, look at me. Yeah. You know, It's just because I'm the one that's standing up there going, listen, shit happens. Yeah. I've put my hands up and said, I've sat in a kitchen on my floor, you know, cry my eyes out. We do do it as blokes, mm. but there is a light. You know, there's a light at the end of the tunnel for people to go, mm. actually, you know what? It's not all mm. doom and gloom. Mm. You know, no matter how bad things can get, you know, whatever trauma you've gone through, there is a way out. Yeah. And hopefully if you've got a good network of friends and family around you, you'll achieve that. Darren, this has yeah. been fantastic, mate. Yeah. I felt like I said a minute ago, I really thank you for your honesty. I think yeah. you're doing really good stuff. And if you like, like you said a minute ago, if you just help and save one person, oh, massively, that's, that's good. But yeah. mate, where can people find you? 
So DarrenBarden.com. We're just yeah. having it revamped now, the yeah. website. Um, the book, Let's Skip to the Good Bits, yeah. on Amazon. Um, and also uh, Taking Care of Business, which is my Facebook and LinkedIn groups, uh, where hopefully this year you'll see more daily input on yeah. those um, where we're helping others. And it's not just a sales thing. Yeah. You know, that's the, the important part. Yeah. Whatever industry you're in, I try and just, if I can, spread a bit of positivity yeah. in the world. Good man, Darren. It's yeah. a pleasure to meet you today. And you, I really do and you. appreciate you coming all the way down from Essex to Bournemouth yeah, it's been, today. It's been great. <laughs> <laughs> You're a good man. Thank you very Cheers, much. Darren. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Thanks.